Good morning. Morning. How are you doing? All right, thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, we're going to learn all about JP Morgan Global Core Real Assets. So, as usual in, on these occasions, can you sort of start off by just explaining a bit about the fund, please, and then we'll get to some questions later on. Perfect. Thanks, James. And obviously, thanks, everyone, uh, for, for joining this morning. So, yeah, kick off in terms of uh, what JARA is. Maybe if you just go on to the, the first kind of summary slide. Um, JARA, we, we launched JARA in uh, 2019. And really what we've, we've looked to launch and, and build is really a kind of foundational or cornerstone allocation for investors uh, within the real asset market. Um, and we get that foundational quality, I would say, in, in, in two key ways. Firstly, it's through our diversification. So as you can see on the right hand side here, uh, we are not a targeted or niche real asset strategy only focused on one particular sector or part of the market. We are broadly diversified across really the, the kind of key three pillars of real assets. So infrastructure uh, with sectors like utilities, uh, energy, fixed transport, like airports and seaports. Uh, transportation, so that's both floating, flying, but also increasingly trains as well. Uh, and then, as you can see at the bottom, real estate and the traditional kind of core four sectors there. So well diversified across the real asset market. Um, we are also, I think, quite uniquely globally diversified. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But um, we are, in many ways, and a lot of our investors do use us as a global complement to their often uh, UK-centric real asset allocations. Um, and then the other key thing that gives us our, um, our kind of cornerstone quality is we are focused, as it really says in the title, uh, we are focused on kind of what we call core assets. And, you know, like any investment uh, asset class, there is a spectrum of real assets, uh, some in the, at the higher end risk of the spectrum, some at the lower um, risk end of the spectrum. We are at that lower risk end. We are core assets for us, are higher quality more income generating assets. And so really the, the real assets we are investing in are um, more stabilized, income orientated, and that ultimately feeds into that cornerstone policy that we're looking to provide investors. So we bring all that together um, and target a seven to 9% total return over, uh, over market cycle of which roughly half to two thirds is coming from a quarterly uh, income stream, you know, current dividend yield, um, in the mid to high fives uh, at the moment. Um, interestingly, I think, and importantly, how do we build a portfolio like this um, that's so well diversified across different markets, different geographies? Well, as you can just see in that bottom uh, left bullet point is we are using the existing JP Morgan alternatives platform to build this. And that means when I talk about a diversified portfolio, I really mean it. Um, over 20 different sectors, on a look-through basis, over 1,400 private assets and over 30 different countries represented in this portfolio. And it's because we're utilising that existing platform uh, to do that. So if we just go on to the, the next slide to show this platform. Um, at a high level, you know, we are a big, at JP Morgan, we are a big alternative player. We have over 212 billion, as we say on the top right, um, in assets under management across alternatives. Um, and alternatives for us is quite a broad church. You know, it's really anything that sits outside traditional public equities and public fixed income. But obviously what's important for JARA is the real asset side of things, which you can see highlighted in the pie chart uh, in the middle. Um, so real estate, other real assets like infrastructure and transportation, but also liquid real assets as well, is a significant part of what we do. It's over half uh, of the platform. And we've been doing that for over 60 years. We've got a significant uh, track record as well. And so, and it's the existing private vehicles, existing private strategies uh, that we are investing in. And I think importantly, uh, a lot of this platform, a lot of this business has historically only been open to the more traditional institutional investors. Uh, so pension funds, insurance companies and the like. And, and really what we have with JARA is a way for private investors to access this institutional quality platform uh, through obviously the, the investment trust structure. Um, my team, the team that manages it, is on the left-hand side, the alternative solutions team. Uh, we've been around for, for over 12 years and our job is to build diversified portfolios exactly like we have with JARA um, using this platform 
uh, and ultimately looking to build portfolios where the sum of the parts are greater than the parts individually. And actually, that's what we think we've achieved uh, with this uh, with this portfolio. So maybe if we go on to the, the next slide, we can just show how we bring this uh, together in terms of uh, an allocation. So on the left hand side, we've got our strategic asset allocation. So, you know, the bands that we operate within in terms of how much is, it, is in real estate, uh, infra and transport and then other parts of the uh, liquid and, uh, and real asset market. And on the right hand side, you can see where we're we're currently positioned. So a um, couple of broad comments here. You know, firstly, you can see that we have this good mix really across the, the real asset spectrum, both public and private. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see where we're currently positioned. So you know, quickly running around the pie chart, we have 35 percent in global real estate. Now, importantly, if you look at them, two little bullet points uh, beneath the, the, the kind of big title, um, you can see that we're focused on U.S. core real estate and Asia Pacific core real estate. Um, so we're not focused and we're not invested in UK and Europe. And that's very, very intentional. Um, really, since IPO, you know, going back to us being a global complement for investors. Um, we know that a lot of investors already have a significant exposure, particularly to the UK within real estate. What they don't have access to, what they find it more difficult to access is Japan residential or logistics in Singapore, or US single-family housing. Uh, and that's exactly what we look to provide exposure to within our real, real estate portfolio. We then have 20% each in infra and transport. And as you can see by the arrows, that's an area that's been increasing throughout 2023 and continues to increase uh, in 2024. And talk about our views and why that's happening uh, later. And then we have um, currently 16% in liquid real assets and 7% in real estate, uh, real asset debt um, to bring together that kind of very, very well diversified, high quality um, portfolio. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we can see what this means from a geographic. And I know I've already banged on about it being a, a global portfolio, maybe one too many times. But um, just to make the point again, as you can see in the middle here, it is, when I say global, we, we really mean it, 55% North America, 18% Europe, of which 2% is in the UK, and and uh, just under 30% in the developed markets, primarily of, of Asia Pacific. Um, and what, why is this kind of global split important? Why do I keep going on about it? I guess, um, I think importantly for us, when it comes to real assets, one of the big drivers of, of risk and return is, is really the local market in which these assets operate. You know, we just talked about battery storage and some of the, the various dynamics that go on in each market there. The, the same is true across all the broader uh, array of uh, real assets. And so um, it's something which really needs diversifying. Um, diversifying that local exposure or that country by country exposure should hopefully allow for you know better outcomes over time. And JARA is, I think, a great option for investors who want to have that global diversification. Um, we talked about the look through private assets, over 1,400 private assets, as you can see on the top left, um, split between infrastructure, transport and uh, real estate. Again, we get that diversification because we are leveraging off that, that portfolio, uh, the underlying platform. Um, and again, because we're so well diversified, uh, we help remove some of the idiosyncratic asset risk and counterparty risk that can often be prevalent in, in the real asset space. Uh, final point on this slide, you know, with a global portfolio does come global currency. Um, we are therefore got a good mix there with a bit of a bias towards dollar. Uh, we have a partial hedge within the portfolio to bring ourselves to 20% sterling. Um, but nevertheless, it's something to be aware of that there is that kind of look through currency exposure that uh, is absolutely present um, you know, in, in the portfolio because of where our assets are based. <clears throat> so if we move on to, on to the next slide, maybe to do a little bit of a uh, a focus on a couple of the, the key areas of portfolio, just because of uh, trying to do this in 15 minutes. So I've decided to focus on infra and transport and real estate. So not talking about the listed or the, or the debt side, um, but happy to answer questions at the end. So here we here we just kind of summarize where we are within infrastructure and transportation. As you can see on the left hand side, um, starting with infrastructure, which is at the top, you can see what we are primarily focused on two key sectors. So utilities and renewable energy. Um, and we're focused there, one, because um, these are the sectors for us that in the infrastructure space can give us the most predictable high quality return profile we're looking for. You know, if you look at that graph on the top right hand side, this is utility spending going back uh, to the late 1970s. And you can see that the, the, the 
cost of utilities as a percentage of household income has gone down. But importantly, from the grey bars, you can see that actually recessions don't really impact uh, how much people are spending on electricity, on water. Uh, people want to continue paying their bills. And so as a, as, a, as a stable provider of return, we see utilities as a, a really, really good uh, asset class. Importantly as well, both for utilities and uh, renewable energy, um, there's a lot of opportunity to invest, particularly in relation to the energy transition, uh, renewable energy for obvious reasons, but also utilities um, do need a significant amount of upgrading to make them resilient uh, to things like global warming, but also um, evolving them to fit the new uh, the new grid. And so a lot of opportunities that we've seen both in the last few years, but also going forward for us to invest uh, in these sectors. Um, On to transport. And again, you can see that there is a bit of a focus for our portfolio in two key sectors. Uh, and actually, these are the more floating sectors. So we are more of a, a float whilst in transport we can allocate to aviation and um, shipping, but also rail car. We are more on the shipping side in maritime and energy logistics. Uh, and what we do in transport is that we're ultimately owning uh, these assets, these shipping assets, these aircraft, and we're leasing them out to counterparties for uh, typically five plus years. And so looking to generate a predictable income stream from that from that return. Um, I think a key thing that we've seen in the uh, transport market, particularly in the last uh, six months, but actually going back further, is, is quite a lot of disruption. Um, you know, a lot of that being more geopolitically driven. So obviously a lot of news around the Red Sea at the moment and the, um, the impact there. If you go back to the kind of the onset of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the, uh, the impact that had on energy um, supply within Europe, and then even going back further to COVID and all of the um, the queuing outside of ports we saw. Um, a lot of these uh, disruptions have, typically have one kind of key trend, and that is ultimately they constrain supply. You know, if like going on in the Red Sea now, if, if ships are going around the Cape of Good Hope and it adds 15 days to a journey, that's a, an artificial constraint on supply. And what you are seeing, uh, as you sh- as you see on the on the bottom right hand side, is that's causing a, an uptick in, in lease rates. And as, a, as an owner of an asset looking to lease these assets out, that has been a positive. Uh, and we do see that kind of ongoing disruption as being something that is going to continue in the transport market. So an area that we've continued to, to, to like. Um, if we can just shift on to the next slide on real estate. Um, again, obviously, a, a market has been a big focus and, and a lot in the news for investors over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, primarily because we've seen a a pretty strong repricing uh, across a number of real estate markets. Now, I think importantly for us, a lot of that repricing has been um, driven by interest rates, not necessarily the fundamentals of the assets. So occupancy, rental growth, on the most part, has been pretty strong, Um, with the exception probably of office and certain markets within office, which we're happy to talk about later. Um, but uh, generally, fundamentals have been good. And so now we are likely at or close to the end of the, the kind of rate hiking cycle across most economies. Um, we do see that as being a kind of key valve that could release uh, some repricing going forward. And if you look at that graph on the right hand side, this is uh, kind of forward looking or unlevered uh, IRRs. So the rate of return expected from, from transactions. You can see that repricing has meant that that is now at the highest level since the financial crisis. So actually, um, pricing on the most part, given fundamentals have been stable, look relatively attractive. Um, but with the key catalyst likely being uh, the unwinding of, of interest rates in key economies uh, at some point later this year, which I know is still a, a moving target somewhat. Uh, I think importantly as well, you know, we ha- do have that geographic diversification. You can see that on the bottom left hand side. Um, across US, but also different markets in Asia. And there has been a significant geographical difference as this repricing has occurred. Um, So whilst UK, Europe and the US have seen some pretty heavy repricing, um, actually um, the Asia market has been pretty stable. That's because of different interest rate environments, different uh, growth rates there. And so having that sector mix or that country mix, I should say, has been a real positive. Um, so that's kind of a, a kind of quick run through on on that portfolio. Maybe just onto the the next slide, please. Um, to bring this together, we've got this really well diversified global portfolio, and we do see a couple. We do see several key themes, um, you know, really playing out. And not to necessarily go through each of these in detail, but these are kind of the key themes we have in the portfolio at the moment. Um, but also uh, themes that we see persisting uh, 
uh, going forward. So one, for example, e-commerce acceleration. Um, you know, there's there's still a very significant um, opportunity there, particularly in certain markets like Asia. Um, and what we are seeing is the ability to invest in it, both in terms of um, logistic assets, but also container ships where we have exposure. Uh, platform acquisition is also a big part of what we do. To explain what that is, you know, ultimately, we see the opportunity to put to uh, incrementally invest behind the existing assets we have, as opposed to constantly going out and buying new ones. So, for example, if we have a, a wind farm platform, um, we see opportunities to make smaller bolt-on acquisitions to them assets um, and therefore grow them, uh, benefit from the synergies of scale. Uh, and that's been a big part of what we've been doing, particularly as rates, as rates have risen. Uh, the energy transition, both in renewables but other parts of the market, as I've already touched on, is definitely going to be a, a continuing theme. Uh, emerging core sectors. Um, so, you know, it's a smaller allocation because it's emerging. Um, but this is where, as uh, you know, things like AI, data centers come online, the types of assets that we'll invest in are evolving. Um, we are a core investor, so we are going to probably evolve slightly more slow, uh, slower than others. As we as we see, we want to see stability of, of regulation and, and technology. Um, but nevertheless, it is creeping into the portfolio and an absolutely an area we see ourselves investing going forward. And finally, we are a long term investor. And so having uh, a long-term outlook in how we manage the in, uh, investments from an environmental perspective, but also a social perspective is really, really important. And is really, you know, all the assets we, we have, you know, very much keep that lens in mind. Um, so onto performance, uh, it's on the next slide. And um, you know, similar with other kind of real asset trusts, I think at the moment, we, we have seen a, a kind of tail of two or two different tails here. Firstly, on the NAV side, which is in the top left. Um, and, you know, with rising interest rate, as we talked about with real estate, there has been a, a difficult um, period for, for a lot of real assets. You know, some markets down 20, 25 percent. And what you can just see with Jara's portfolio, if you look at the uh, the last line on that top table over one year, local currency returns, so stripping out the impact of currency, we've had a pretty much flat total return. Um, and so actually we've held up pretty well in what's been quite a difficult market um, from an NAV perspective. Um and that's really the real estate side um, having some impact to NAVs, but being offset by um, the positive performance we've seen in infrastructure and transport. And that's really what JARA is designed to do is to be a bit more stable than any one particular sector focus um, and really give greater stability over time uh, because of that. Um, and so we've seen a stable return. If you look at slightly longer term numbers, so over three years or since we've been fully invested, you can see we're actually more in line with our kind of target return just under from a GBP perspective in terms of the seven to nine percent. And you can see that the income that we're targeting has broadly been in that four to six range um, that we're that we've been aiming for. Um, there is a different story though with share price. Um, and you know, similar to other income or alternative or real asset vehicles in the market, we have seen um, some or some pretty significant uh, discount volatility uh, and that widen out and impact share price returns. But hopefully with that stability of um, NAV and the fact that we are hopefully close to uh, interest rates across key economies being cut and therefore providing, I think, further tailwind to the real estate side, but also the infrastructure and transport side that's been uh, pretty strong performing. Um, hopefully we're in a, in a good position to see that uh, or have a catalyst for that to re-rate uh, as that starts to come through. I think another key point that you know, rates have been one, I think, key, a factor. Um, for um, the derating across the, the real asset market. The other is, I think, concerns around valuation. And maybe if we just go on to the next slide, um, we we have looked to address this. And, I, you know, there's, there's a concern about from investors around, okay, what are private market valuations looking like? Uh, and, you know, are they actually the same as the appraisal values that these vehicles use as part of their NAV? And so what we've done, and this is really driven by, uh, by the board, is, is we've actually looked at, um, going back now 18 months, what has been the sale value of the underlying portfolios versus their appraisal value across all the asset classes we invest across? And so as you can see, we have about 15 uh, different transactions going back to, to Q2, Q22. Um, and again, across really all, all of the key, the key markets we're invested on. And as you can see, there is some variability. But on average, the assets that have been sold within the underlying portfolios have been sold at just above plus 
compared to the holding value. And so I think that's important that actually, you know, we do have a robust quarterly valuation process. Uh, it is significantly independent using uh, the usual third parties. Uh, and that's, you know, really, I think, played out in the consistency of the valuation versus sale price um, on an average basis. And hopefully it gives investors some comfort that, uh, again, hopefully a catalyst as uh, things hopefully re-rate, that the valuations is a fair and true reflection uh, of, of what can actually be achieved in the market. Um, I think final final slide for me uh, on the next slide before we open up and see if there's any questions. Um, hopefully I've touched on a lot of these as I've gone through the portfolio, but obviously that, that discount has been uh, has been there for, um, you know, throughout the kind of second half in particular of 2023. Uh, we have obviously done taken a number of steps alongside the board to look to uh, narrow that and position Jara as best as possible uh, going forward. So, for example, we, you know that we have seen an increase in the, in the quarterly dividend by five percent year on year. Um, we continue to reduce real estate exposure. Um, that has dropped now by by pretty much five percent um, since we, we started that. Um, you know, we do see actually real estate pricing now starting to hold up. Um, but nevertheless, the, the the benefits, the higher income, the stability, and also the benefits they'll see from the energy transition and infrastructure and transport mean that is an area that we are uh, looking to increase. Look to dampen some of the currency um, fluctuations that have uh, caused a bit of additional volatility in the NAV as well, as we talked about with the partial hedge. Uh, and the board have been proactive from a buyback perspective as well. Um, we pushed about 4% so far, and that's been an ongoing program. So uh, very much focused on how and creating the catalyst for that, that discount to narrow it in the not too distant future. So maybe final slide, just as, a, as the summary slide, one we can leave up as, as maybe questions come in. Um, but, you know, in summary, Jara, you know, we are a core real asset portfolio uh, that can really act for investors as a foundation allocation um, within their portfolios, given our focus and our diversification on core across core assets. Um, we have a very, very significant level of disposure, both across private assets of over 1,400, but also on a global basis. So we are quite unique in the market from that perspective. Uh, and we, as, as I hopefully kind of touched on, we see a lot of opportunities, both particularly across infrastructure and transport, uh, which are key areas we like, and we are increasing within the portfolio. And I'll pause there. Great, thank you very much, Phil. Um, it's a sort of whistle-stop tour around the world. Um, Couple of questions on the dividend first, I think. Um, so firstly, is the dividend covered by earnings now? And how important is it that it, it whether it is covered or not? Um, so the dividend hasn't always been covered. Um, and there has been a bit of variability, particularly in some of the, the sleeves and, and real estate, particularly last year, slightly lower income. Um but with, with the with the kind of additional share capital from share issuances, um, you know, the board have used their additional kind of flexibility to kind of keep it and maintain it. Um, and I think as we go into, as we in particular increase that allocation to infrastructure and transfer, that will allow it to be covered uh, more fully going forward. And that is a, a focus for the board. Um, so yeah, I think in particular it will come that will come from and uh, the full coverage will come from increased allocations to infrastructure and transport, where the yield is is materially higher. Um, from then the real estate side, and that is uh, one key aspect of our of our uh, motivation to increasing it. As long as some of the other key trends we see, such as you know these markets are slightly more linked to inflation, so to the extent we have uh, inflation volatility going forward, um, they should benefit. As well as they're kind of slightly closer linked to to key trends across the energy transition. Um, and so yeah, the board are focused on making sure that is and remains covered. Um, and you know that's why that's why one of the reasons that the asset allocation is evolving slightly. Fair enough, that makes sense. Um, in your mind, though, would it make more sense to grow the dividend or use the money that you would have used to grow the dividend to buy back more stock? It's a difficult one because I mean, and ultimately a, a question for the board. Um, I think the board do have the firepower. Uh, to uh, continue the buyback program um, because of that listed allocation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have 16%, uh, sorry, in, in more listed real assets. So we're not a uh, real asset portfolio that is, for example, fully invested in private assets with no liquidity and, and, and has an RCF on top to do, uh, to do buybacks. We're actually more prudently structured than that. 
And so I don't think uh, you would necessarily need to hold uh, uh, cash flow back in order to continue the buyback program. Um, and ultimately, the, the, what that liquid allocation does, importantly, is it gives you time. So if you do have some operational requirements in terms of um, cash flow to use a listed side and then rebalance more fully over time outside of, out of the privates, which obviously takes a bit longer. And so I think the board actually have flexibility not to um, to do both. Okay, that makes sense. Um, how liquid or illiquid is the underlying portfolio generally? I, mean, I suppose it varies by asset, but um, is there like an active secondary market for a lot of this stuff? Um, yeah, so we, we are, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, we are primarily focused in the private side of investing in open-ended vehicles. Um, and so um, that means that typically on a quarterly basis, we have the ability um, to either subscribe further uh, or make redemptions. And you see, you typically submit, you know, uh, 30 days before quarter end, I'm, I'm averaging here, and, and then you get your capital back on a best efforts basis, um, 60 to 90 days thereafter. There are typically lockups. This is why it's quite these underlying vehicles themselves are quite institutional. Uh, we are generally through the lockups now, uh, as we've been going for, for four years. And so we do have the ability to um, get some capital out of the portfolio. That's been one way that we've actually been looking to increase the infrastructure and transport. We've actually been redeeming over time from the real estate equity side of things. And, and as money has come back, um, we have uh, increased in particular so far, we've increased our allocation to the infrastructure uh, side of things. Um, but yeah, it is naturally um, yeah, less liquid than, than public markets. Um, but given the nature of how we're allocating to, there is the ability to um, evolve over time. You know, you can't wake up every day and, and try to underweight private real estate versus private infrastructure. What you can do is evolve it over time to, to kind of, you know, meet the, uh, the needs of the company and also the market environment that we, that we think we're entering. Fair enough, thank you. Um, how sensitive is this portfolio to changes in interest rates? Um, and does it matter that we've got the sort of delay in rate cuts? Yeah, so I think it's, um, you know, one of the the, the natural uh, kind of points of jar, you know, we, we have this diversification across asset classes, and that means that different asset classes will behave quite differently. And that's ultimately, we thought, a benefit over time to hopefully smooth out some of the volatility that any one asset class can, can see. Um, so, you know, where we have seen the um, rate sensitivity is in real estate equity, which is um, about 35% of the portfolio. Um, and yes, that, I think that will benefit, you know, particularly I think within the US market, you know, some of the, the price declines have probably been, uh, in particular, not pricing in a soft landing, but pricing in a more of a recession scenario. So to the extent we do start to see um, that soft landing firming up, as well as some rate cuts towards the end of the year, that would benefit um, the real estate side. Um, infrastructure and transportation have been less sensitive. Um, and um, there are various reasons for that. Um, one is, I think in particular, is the debt profile is longer. And so um, you haven't seen the same drag that kind of feeds more quickly into uh, the real estate side. And then there's also been some parts of the market that have been positively impacted. So actually real estate debt, one of the reasons we actually added that allocation in 2022 was it's primarily floating rate. And so uh, that's actually benefited as rates have gone up. Um, and so, you know, when we first allocated to it, I think we're getting probably a five and a half, six percent net yield. We're, we're now in the kind of more eight region. Um, and so that has benefited and that was part of the portfolio construction why we added it as we saw that was likely, you know, that the rising rate environment was likely going to be a drag on uh, on real estate. Now, one of the points to make is we are not necessarily focused on one particular market of of, uh, of uh, rates either. Um, so we're not linked necessarily to the UK rates and actually, you know, only 2% there. Um, the US is probably the most, the, the main focus. But again, we do have things like, you know, Japanese residential. We have uh, markets in a, exposure to Australia, Singapore, which are all on their own kind of interest rate hiking cycles. And so that, again, that, that diversification plays into the portfolio and hopefully smooths things out as well. Okay, thank you. Um there's a question here about digital infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, I, you, you said data centers. So I saw that was in the as kind of emerging core bit. 
Um, what's your view on digital infrastructure as, a, as an asset class and would you like to have more of it? Yeah, so actually the data centres we've done, you know, and this can be a bit of a, a, a grey line, I guess, in the cost industry. We've actually mainly done that in, in the real estate bucket, um, as it were, uh, so far. Um, and we, within our infrastructure, have not really um, entered into the, the digital infrastructure side of things. And I think very simply for us is, um, you know, we are looking across the portfolio and obviously within infrastructure itself, looking for that, the core side of uh, return, the return profile. So we're looking for assets that can produce a contracted, regulated income stream that's highly predictable and highly forecast. In order to get that, you need um, reg stable regulatory systems, stable technology, um, high quality counterparties. And typically, as industries mature, the, the length of the contract gets longer as well. Uh, and obviously, whilst it's a market that we follow and have, have looked into detail, it really hasn't ticked all them boxes from a core perspective yet. Um, because, you know, there is still the ability for things to evolve. There is still regulatory change that will probably happen. Um, and so we have, whilst we have, we can enter it at some point in the future, it's not been an area that we've looked to because it hasn't really fitted um, that core return profile, that core aspect that, that we're looking for. Um, and also, you know, Canada, there's probably slightly higher pricing there at the moment as well, uh, given the, the focus on it um, compared to kind of where we've been deploying in um, in the more kind of smaller platform acquisitions. I mentioned the Bolton acquisitions in renewables and utilities that have been you know, very much more our stomping ground over the last 12 to 18 months. You talked about the returns available on private, uh, sorry, sorry, real estate debt um, just now. Yeah. Um, what sort of returns are you getting on your investments generally? In in real estate debt? Well, no, across the piece, across, across the whole thing. Um, so so in, ter in terms of where, so where we're expecting If you're making a new, new investment tomorrow, what sort of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, right now probably, um, you say I think we had an IRR chart in, uh, for example, in the – for the um, – to the real estate side, you know, you're looking at um, somewhere between, on a core perspective, um, eight to nine percent from a from a real estate perspective, uh, and you're probably looking at around ten percent for transport. That is that is probably bit, what the asset class is a bit more core plus, a um, little bit more leverage. Um, you you know you are actually generating a gross income from a lot of transport assets of uh, close to twelve percent, um, and so that's where you get to that kind of ten percent number. Uh, and then on the infrastructure side, probably a little bit lower. Um, so probably kind of the seven to eight percent number uh, for uh, for infrastructure, particularly in the core space. Um, in you know before the repricing in real estate, that was probably the the slightly lower end of the things. So probably it was in the kind of six percent, but now that's repriced. Um, you know you're you're closer to kind of uh, low double digits there. So that's the way it looks. I mean, obviously, um, you know the drivers of returns not necessarily about every. It's not all about where you're putting the next dollar of capital. It's obviously the existing assets you have. Um, but yeah, that that's where we're currently kind of seeing the the general underwriting. I think. Yeah, I mean, but I, I mean, talking about the sort of return target is over a cycle, and we've had a part of the cycle where returns have been quite low because the interest rates have been quite low. But now we've got a a higher return environment, and that will all average out. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that, that is. I think. I think you know. We were in obviously a higher rate environment. There are some some negatives for real assets with that, where obviously cost these days are typically levered assets. So we don't have any leverage at the company level, um, so we are unlevered. So I think you know some of the, the issues around leverage uh, at the company level that you've seen in the investment company market isn't isn't uh, re uh, relevant to Jara. But there is a, a leverage at the asset level, and that can be a bit of a drag. Um, but with higher rates, actually, you should be earning the underlying. Uh, rental yoke growth, the underlying income growth should offset that over time and, and therefore help you generate a, a higher return. As I say, we, we are seeing that in particular in, in the transport market and now with the repricing in, in real estate, you get that average over time for sure. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, just sort of digging slightly into the, the emerging core stuff. Uh, what's in the emerging core things that you, you think you might actually put some money behind? Yeah, sure. So, um, the emerging core, so if you think about it, I maybe go across each, each of the kind of key pillars um, uh, separately. So 
real estate first you know i think where, where we've kind of dipped our toe so far from, a, from an emerging core perspective so new types of sectors is is really actually variations of the of the big ones so if you think about for example uh, office you know actually an area that we have still added in office over the last um you know 12 months or so has been um more like biotech healthcare specialized office in, in obviously industries that are growing and, and do need office space um another big focus for us is actually residential um and a new sector of residential in particular more single family housing now if you think about institutional investing um when you think about when people talk about residential they often mean big apartment buildings you know 30 floors and uh, you you invest in one and, and and you obviously you rent each one each one out um technology but also demand you know the the generation rent the millennial generation is now i think on average over 30 um you've got families within that cohort now so actually there's a demand for single family rentals as well so actually yeah, being able to buy up um and rent out single family housing is, is a new sector that, we, that we've entered into um from a from an infrastructure perspective i say we're probably moving a little bit more slowly um but we have done on the margin things like battery storage um not in the uk more globally um and we have um done um biomass as well from an energy uh, development perspective and uh, they're more smaller allocations that we're looking to understand the technology and then, and then grow over time uh, and then finally um an area on, on the transportation side um maybe less true emerging but you know one area that we have increased uh you know exposure significantly is liquid natural gas carriers um and you know that was a you know was an established market but one that's clearly erupted in terms of demand over the last few years we actually decided to enter that back in 2019 with a bunch you know and we actually put on a number of new build contracts so got assets delivered um in 2022 2023 just as the demand was, was, was spiking um and so that's been an area in transport as well as um we do like things like um wind farm maintenance vessels so uh, as as um Offshore wind farms have become more prevalent. They've also got further and further out to sea, so you need more specialised vessels. And again, that's a, a new area that we've um, we've been investing in. So often these um, these new sectors are smaller allocations to start with, and then they grow over time. But they're the kind of opportunities that we're, we're either invested in or tracking. Um, I think at the moment. Oh, just the discount. Um, yeah. Obviously, it's it's a massive opportunity for investors if the discount can can narrow. What do you think the the core ways of that the key ways of that might happen might it will be and um and also do you think it's fair to to look at the discount on this and compare it to the discount on infrastructure funds, for example? Yes, yeah, so maybe if I take that that first one, sorry, that second one first. Um, so you know what what we have seen and it, it varies from time to time depending on, on certain market conditions actually um you know we are a mix of real estate and infra and you know broadly that we have on the most part traded somewhere between the two um and you know clearly there is a slightly tighter rating i'd say on average there's obviously different companies are behaving differently in the infrastructure space and so to the extent we can trade uh, more in line with that um clearly that's a, a positive uh, for everyone but yeah generally i would i would expect us and um you know uh to trade either in between the two or maybe slightly close to infrastructure given we are focused on that more income generating stabilized part of the market um so that's kind of uh that sort of thing i think in terms of the the narrowing of the discount i think clearly there's a, a broad dislocation in the market uh across alternative income strategies and there there's probably three key key drivers of that well i see one is where there's been idiosyncratic you know particular you know certain vehicles having particular issues whether it's around leverage or pricing etc um but then there's you know more i'd say broader kind of terms which is one um the views around valuations and two um the interest rate environment meaning some investors are going well i you know um how do i how do i price this first other income uh, options uh, and ultimately, I think, you know, we just we went through that slide on valuations where we feel that you know, a very, very independent and robust valuation process that has played out to be, I think, a really true uh, reflection of, of NAV um, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, you are going to have you are going to see you need to see 
uh, some um, some easing of interest rates before um, before that repricing across the market. This is uh, starts to occur. Obviously, within that, we are now look we are looking to do what we can, and so uh, as you say, infrastructure, certain transport names trade a bit more tightly, and, and we've been leaning into that both in terms of a portfolio management conviction, income, as we discussed with the board, and also we, we see the benefit from that in terms of uh, market demand. Um, and then also increasing the income um, and share buybacks will incrementally help. But I think it's, it's as ever with these things, it's a package as opposed to a, a golden bullet um, that will uh, that will, will, will solve, uh, solve everything. Fair enough. Do you think, is the size of the fund uh a problem especially if you did more by share buybacks uh or doesn't it really matter from from the way that you're running the portfolio yeah so and also we wanna, yeah would you like to make it bigger well i obviously like to take big but but do you think it's feasible to make it bigger so i think one of the really nice things about jar is so you know we're, we're investing in these these existing private vehicles and actually whether jar is 100 million or 500 million our portfolio is can actually have a very, very similar diversification. And so our ability to, you know, we've already got significant diversification over 1,400 private assets. Um, and because we've got these existing portfolios already, um, we can get that diversification ir- to some extent, irrespective of size. That's, that's obviously, I think, a positive. The other positive there is actually these underlying portfolios are always evolving because we're not the only investor. We've got other institutional investors alongside us. Uh, and so actually, even if Jara hasn't got another dollar of capital to invest right now, um, actually, we may still be buying assets in the underlying portfolios of which Jara then becomes a, um, a, a, a small owner of and have exposure to. And so we're able to evolve the portfolio on a look-through basis um, irrespective as well, which I think is really, really important. It means we're not just stuck with the same assets. We can we can absolutely move into areas uh, that we have co- conviction. Um, do we see an opportunity to to grow it? Yes, absolutely. I think um, hopefully as this period of dislocation um, subsides, then you know we have a pipe. We have a strong pipeline. Uh, we do see continued opportunities for Jara to invest both in the existing strategy, but potentially uh, new ones that come along as well. Uh, and obviously, as it grows, that increases in liquidity, reduces costs, all things that benefit uh, shareholders as well. And so I think there's absolutely a, a strategic focus for us to do that um, as and when the time allows us. Great. Well, good luck with all that. I do hope it does grow. It's just, I think it's doing something different, which is always cool, I think. Um, so um, thank you very much for your time this morning. And um, we'll get you on again in a year or so. No, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we'll be back next week talking to Ecofin. It's slightly similar. Uh, well, some sort of overlaps a little bit, uh, but more listed stuff. Uh, so Jean will be there uh, on the 19th, and then we've got a full lineup as usual. Uh, we are still nailing down the 3rd of May one, but I think we are almost there. Um, so in the meantime, have a good weekend, have a good week, and we will see you next Friday. Thank you.